Welcome everyone, and I'm pleased to welcome Gina Hassan as a speaker to the World Day ADC today. Gina has over 15 years of experience working in a variety of sectors uh, throughout the US, Middle East, Latin America, and Africa. Um, her experience living in the Middle East, um, that's where she grew up actually, motivated her to transition to international development work after the grad school. She has since worked with the UN and USAID, designing solutions for, that provided access to information to uh, not only project staff, but also communities with low literacy and novice technology usage. Gina currently leads digital design team for Suktel Digital Solutions. It's a company that designs and develops solutions for humanitarian aid sector. She's passionate about social equity and justice and thinking about how those can play a role in the design. And today we're going to hear Gina talking about designing for developing nations. Welcome, Gina. Thank you. Hello, welcome everybody. I have to remember to stay close to the microphone. I'm, I'm, a, I'm usually a very antsy person. I like to walk, use my hands, very Middle Eastern like that way. Um, welcome. Uh, so yes, I am Gina Asaf. Uh, and uh, my topic today is principles and best practices for designing digital services and products for developing nations. Um, however, caveat, it's in the international aid and development context specifically. So, you know, there is, uh, you know, design happening and technology happening in developing nations, um, you know, that may be for users that are more similar to us um, as users, um, but here we're talking about the users that are, in, you know, the kind of the need and, and are, are getting uh, development and aid uh, projects and design work for them. Uh, this is what I'm going to be talking about. We like to, again, I kind of give an overview. Uh, Introduce myself, why am I speaking about this topic? Would love to know who's in the audience just so I can you know, tailor a little bit of what I'm talking to um, you know, as I go. Uh, what, is, what is unique and challenging about this space? Um, you know, it's design work, it's technology work. How is it different than anything else you guys are doing or anybody else that's doing any design and technology work? Um, and then you know, I've come up with some design principles and best practices with my three years of experience working um, in development and in collaboration with other designers and technologists that are working in this space. Uh, so you know, it's kind of some best design principles and practices that, that have been helping me along the way. Um, and, then in, and then how can this apply to you as a designer and technologist working in other spaces? Um, as, as I see, there, there are a lot of intersections and a lot of uh, ways we can learn uh, you, you guys can learn from, you know, designers working in maybe the public sector can learn from, and we can learn from, from them. And then just general, I have some resources I'd like to share with you all. Who am I? Now this, this uh, I love the, I, I use the, the slides that were given to me by <laughs> the WAID, they're beautiful, however, my picture being this big is a little weird. Uh, but anyways, uh, uh, that's me, I'm Gina Asaf. So I, um, you know, as um, Ian was saying, I grew up in the Middle East, uh, so uh, my family is roots are Palestinian, so you know family refugees. So you know I kind of have that uh, feeling of you know wanting to provide aid and, and working back with you know the people that I see as similar back, familiar background as I am. Um, I worked in the private sector for most of my career. Uh, worked at Intuit. Um, there's another fellow Intuit in the audience. I found out today. Uh, worked uh, at, at a you know a company in Silicon Valley in San Francisco startup. And then after I did my master's in HCI um, at Carnegie Mellon, I took a class in doing social, you know, social good, and and it totally motivated me to want to work uh, specifically in kind of more impactful areas, and uh, hence me kind of marrying my background in international development and working on social impact and, and design. So kind of you know motivated me to move to DC to DC and work for international development sector. My organization is Suktel. Uh, we um, are an international company, so there's like four or five of us in D.C. I'm barely in D.C. I'm usually somewhere else, uh, so uh, typically jet-lagged all the time. Um, have a lot of miles, though, so that's on the plus side. Uh, but uh, our company is, we our CEO is in Canada. We have a team in the, the West Bank and Palestine that are doing the coding. Uh, we um, are in Europe. We're all over the place. So, um, and I typically, um, you know, am on site in the field working with our users and the clients. Would love to know who's in the audience. So raise up hands, who here works in the public sector? All right, good amount, awesome. Private sector? Cool. How many of you are designers? PMs? Uh, more on the business side? 
All right, cool. So it's a good mix. Awesome. That's what I expected. Um, I, I, you know, I met a couple of folks here that work at USCS, which is kind of awesome because there's a lot of intersections between the work that they're doing more on a local level, national level, and kind of the international development field. So, you know, I'd, I'd love to hear back from anybody that feels that, you know, some of the, what I'm talking about applies to the work that they're doing. Um, and I'll have a discussion about that towards the end. Uh, defining the space. So, you know, so there's nobody here that works in the international development sector, is there? Oh, awesome. Cool. So a couple of you guys. Cool. So, you know, correct me if I'm mistaken here or like, you know, provide input. I would love it. Um, so what, it, what does it mean? What does it mean that I designed for the international development sector? So, uh, you know, I work for users in developing nations that are in vulnerable conditions with low resources. Again, I'm not designing for, you know, you know, the, the more, you know, I guess the more resourceful, you know, high end, you know, user that is using Facebook or have smartphones like us, but more for the ones that are in kind of the remote villages that are kind of the, very, the most low resources in, in these countries. Um, of course, we also work with aid workers who are working with the beneficiaries. And that's a lot of our work as well. But I mean, for the purpose of this talk, most of my principles were developed thinking of the, the end user, the beneficiary. However, some of these principles do apply in general to all, the, to all of the um, users of our systems. Um, so in general, you know, I mean, development, USAID was uh, born in, um, you know, in, in a time where to, to think of how, do you, how are we gonna, as a rich, economically well country, help some of the poorer nations, you know, uh, tackle some of their, um, you know, equities and, and, and kind of get them to a level where, um, you know, there's there's no poverty or education is not an issue. And so the work that I do is in line with that. It's like social good and impact that is motivated, you know, somewhat politically, of course, because these are governments that are funding these projects. And when there's government, there's politics involved. So, um, you know, they are funded by the government and it's implemented by governmental and non-governmental agencies. So that's kind of the area of work that I'm in. Um, the type of products that I work on are, you know, they range from all sorts of things. So we're trying to maybe get, um, you know, youth that are, can't find jobs in areas because, um, you know, there's no way to connect job seekers with the, with the, with the jobs out there. Um, and another one is, you know, going to villages in, uh, in rural Egypt where education of children is really low or like the, the women the literacy is very high. Uh, water issues in Jordan. Um, so it ranges for, you know, on, on, you know, many different areas and, uh, you know, mobile apps uh, that are, you know, Android or SMS type interactions, USSD, if you guys have heard of, I'll talk a little bit about that more later, um, you know, so, so range of type of products, all, you know, serving whatever, uh, whatever the goal of the, of the project is. So I kind of drew like a simplified version of what the landscape is um, in, uh, in what, you know, how, how we work. So you have the funders at the top, you have USAID, the World Bank, United Nations. These are the, um, you know, the organizations that are starting and saying, hey, we need to eliminate, uh, you know, illiteracy in Egypt, for example. If, if some research was done, either the government uh, in Egypt is, you know, asking for that help or, you know, something triggers that. And so the USAID puts out a bid and says, hey, um, who can help us from you contractors down here? And there's many of them. You guys must have, you may have heard of Save the Children. You've heard of EDC, of the um, International Youth Foundation, the IRC. So these are all what we call implementing agencies. These are the guys with the expertise. They have like your top level education people. They have their agri, you know, the ag people that are like know so much about agriculture that are, you know, in democracy and governance. So you have them specialized in certain fields. Some of these organizations have specialty in multiple fields. And some of them are specialized in one field. So you have like EDC, which is mainly education, for example. And so these guys put out a uh, bid on, on, you know, or put out a, um, like their proposal on a contract and say, this is how we're going to implement it. And then once they win the bid, that's when they start hiring in-country field staff to kind of assist them in implementing this project. And usually the in-country field staff are local to the country. However, there are sometimes expats that come in if you do not have the specialty in the country. And then, you know, you have the beneficiary populations that are benefiting. These are the children that need the education. These are the mothers that are illiterate that are going to get the education. Um, and so where does design and technology fit in this? So on the left-hand side, um, I'm, you know, I kind of have this uh, area where I'm talking about where conceptual and high-level design happens. And this is not an always. This is like maybe kind of like closer to like the, what you'd want ideally. They're talking about technology at that point. 
Um, so in the contract, sometimes they'll put in very little language, like we need a tool for supervisors or we need a tool for education. We need a tool for supervisors and teachers to better communicate. And that's all you'll get. And sometimes it's like completely off once you get down to like what is actually needed on the ground. And sometimes it's, uh, you know, it's just, you know, jargon basically that they're just saying we're using technology. Um, and then once you get down to, once the project is implemented, which might happen two years from when the contract actually was started, uh, then you'll see maybe the needs have changed potentially. So, but this is where you as a designer and a technologist are gonna push for working um, in the field to get as much possible information um, while it's being implemented and not, not assume anything that you had as assumed earlier on in the process. So that's it in a nutshell. Of course, I'm simplifying this and there's a lot more here, but I just kind of wanted to give you guys an overview if you're not familiar with how this works. And so Souptel works uh, kind of with the implementing partners and the in-country field staff. Uh, mainly, um, I mainly work with the in-country field staff and the beneficiary populations. My, you know, the BD, business development team works more with the country staff. So, but we try to like, you know, inject design principles from the beginning um, in terms of like getting the needs. So what is unique and challenging about designing for this space? I've mentioned a few of them already. Um, so I'll try to, you know, not spend too much time on here, but you know, so, you know, ideally you are working, the designers are hired locally and the technologists are hired locally. That's what you want with development. You want to build capacity. That's like a goal of, of international development. But there are issues with that because the capacity is so low, especially from a design perspective. There are te countries that have high capacity with technology, but you won't see any, you know, UX design or, or what we, what we consider, you know, what is important to, to build good software um, or impactful software. And so, you know, you're coming in as a foreigner um, and, it, and it's foreign to you culturally, politically, socioeconomically. Um, you're working mainly, so this is, this is a good, it's a good and a bad, you know, you're working, this is, when I came in from the private sector, I remember thinking, wow, I'm like, you know, the only technology design person in this room, which never happened when I was in, like, you, you were, you know, you are the people, you're the tech people, right? You're in a tech company. But I was working in these companies where I had, like, somebody that was a PhD in education, like, somebody that knows everything about literacy. And I was thinking, wow, this is such a gold mine for coming up with, like, problems. And, and if we can get more of that, you know, the technologists and the and these experts are working together, um, but it was more on their terms, right? Because when you're in a technology company, like at Intuit, we had, um, you know, TurboTax, who would hire tax expertise, but it was on the technologist terms, or we, we were setting the agenda. So it's a little bit of a different of an inverted model. Um, and I think it's a, it's a good thing, but it's challenging. Um, yeah, and then you're still um, educating, um, you know, some of the, the funders, USAID. Now, of course, it's getting better. In the past, you know, exponentially, it's getting a lot better. You have the Global Development Lab. You have a lot more happening where technology and design is a lot more, you know, encouraged and they're seeing the value of it. But you're still educating them on this. So it's, it's a challenge. Funding model, and I explain this a bit, um, you know, you have, we have a model where these outputs are sometimes defined, you know, way in advance. Um, and sometimes they do not correspond to what is actually happening in the ground. In addition to that, you know, you really have to understand the motivation of the funder. You know, again, we're talking about gov governments funding this. There's political motivations. There's things that may not relate exactly to what you see on the ground. So this is a big challenge that you sometimes have to reconcile somehow, either by educating the funder or somehow fitting in, you know, what is needed there uh, for, for both, um, both people. Um, and yeah, you're, you're educating the funder in this case, which is, which is something that, um, you know, like you're like, hey, you guys did this research two years ago, technology has changed, so, uh, you know, we need to change some of, some of what you guys put down here, and that's somewhat of a challenge. The users are, you know, some, we're working with some of the most vulnerable and uh, low resource communities in the world, so that's challenging, you can imagine. Um, you can't use the tools that we're used to that make sense to us. You have to think about what makes sense to them. There's uh, variation in their usage. So you have, you know, we're having more of the younger generation. I mean, similar to here, although it's more extreme there, where you have like maybe the, the you know, the, the college students, the newly graduates that are more, um, you know, kind of getting smartphones, spending all their money on like getting internet access and they're getting on Facebook, they're getting on WhatsApp. But then the ones that are a little bit older and not much, very much older, they, they just are using feature phones and they're on, they, only, they mainly use their phones for phone calls. So there's a, an extreme variation there you'll see, and especially in the communities that we're working in. And then um, in general, you have general literacy issues. So you have, um, 
illiterate folks, a lot of illiterate folks that can't read, um, you know, read what, what, what's, if you're using technology and you're relying on text, that's going to be a problem. And then, of course, because we work in different countries, and sometimes we're working on a project that uh, spans multiple countries, but it's the same goal, and, you know, you definitely can't deploy or come up with an idea for one country that's going to work for others because of the cultural differences, the, the norms that are different, so this is another challenge that kind of we come up with. Um, yeah, you know, the low bandwidth issue, I'm sure you guys have heard of, you know, there's issues with that. You might have villages where there's no internet at all, or if there's internet, it's once once a week, or, you know, maybe once every other week they can, you know, they have, or, or they have to go to the, to the, some cafe, which is half hour away from them in a different village that might have internet. Um, and then this last one is more about, you know, getting access to users. So, a lot of times, you know, when you're wanting, when you're doing design, you want to design with the user, obviously. As we all know, I'm not going to preach that subject. But in this case, uh, uh, in this case, there, you don't have access to the user, whether it's in a, you know, post-conflict zone, um, or there's budget constraints, and you know, where you're not, there's not enough money to fly you out to kind of like talk to the user. So you know, you have to be innovative about getting access to understanding who your users are. So that, that's it in a kind of a summary of some of the challenges uh, that we've you know I've seen we've seen there as a designer and a, and a you know technologist in that space. So based on those uh, you know those challenges, um, you know some thoughts I have around you know you know the, just to keep in mind as you're designing for this crowd or this group of people in these communities and, and in collaboration with other designers that exist in this field, that we kind of came up with a few um, principles here. Um, so the first one is, you know, kind of one that addresses the, you know, what we discussed earlier in terms of the low literacy uh, rates. Um, so, you know, you, you, come, you, you wanna, some of our services that we provide are around relaying information to as many people as possible, right? And if, you're, if your users cannot read, um, you know, that's a problem, right? So, one of, I don't know, are you guys familiar with IVR technology? Yeah, so this is something that's not super, you know, common in, in our, in, in, we don't use it very much here, but it's extremely common there. It's interactive voice response. So you can get information via voice recording and via um, you know, your, your keypad. Um, so this is something that you know, I had to learn about when I first kind of went into this sector because it's something uh, that you know, we don't often, we don't use here very often. And then even um, if they are literate and they're reading, you, know, you gotta consider technologies that we kind of don't use here very much, like SMS and USSD, uh, because they are using them a lot there. Um, and so, you know, you don't want to introduce something new, and then they don't have internet, so you're going to have to find ways to get to the, get the information to them in ways that they are used to getting information. So an example of this is when we were in Egypt working on an agricultural project, so we did a, a farmer, we call it a farmer extension tool. This is where, you know, we, uh, they were kind of giving farmers new ways of um, um, doing agriculture, like whether it's crops, whether it's methods of, you know, how to do your crops, and they needed to give them a way to contact the experts, um, the agronomists, um, to, get, to get information. And so when we, when we did our research, we realized, and we were talking, we did look at the research in Egypt, it turns out that, um, you know, there's a really high, there's an extreme variation in our users. We have the older farmers who kind of have control over the farms for the most part. And these guys are, you know, the majority of them, I just have feature phones and, and they may only use their phone for phone calls. That's all, they're like, what else could you use your phone for? Um, and then you have the kind of the younger, they're, they're children that are coming back from you know, being educated, they come back to their villages and they wanna help. And, and you know, these, these kids are on, they have smartphones, they're putting all their money towards smartphones. So you know, we, we were like, we, can't, we don't wanna like isolate the, you know, the younger generation and we wanna get them involved because that's great. But then we also wanna make sure that our you know, the older generation is going to use our services. So we actually did a multi-channel approach where you could access our service and the information with whatever, you know, whether it was SMS, USSD, IVR, we did a Facebook chat bot for, the, for, the, for them, and then a WhatsApp. So, you know, we, using a multi-channel approach is critical here. Um, and then you can use multimedia, that's great as well. You know, images speak a thousand words, and, you know, that's so much easier to convey the information. So that, that's something we try to do as well. Um, other other uh, principle I have here is, you know, find them where they already are. Now, this is, uh, you know, kind of uh, something, you know, again, a lot of these principles may, you've heard of them and they apply in general to design, but I guess they're just more prominent and more something to consider uh, when you're working with, these, with this group of people, these communities. So, you know, the idea here is, you know, you want to, 
you want to find these users. You don't want to introduce something new, especially if their technology literacy is not high or if, you know, if you're trying to do a network effect. I mean, this is obvious. You want to go to places where they already are. So in Jordan, uh, we had a workforce development project and Jordan actually has a really interesting rate because I think like 95% of users are using what there's like a huge like WhatsApp, like insane WhatsApp usage there. And um, so you, like, you go walk down the streets on the cafes, you'll see signs that say, um, you know, add our number as a business, you know, we can, we'll contact you and people do that. So this is, this is uh, you know, we wanted to capital, capitalize on that technology usage. So for workforce development interaction with our students and the youth, we chose WhatsApp as our medium and that worked way better than what they had thought originally was to use SMS or to come up with a new product or a new app, which they kind of try to test out. Um, and so, yeah, also Facebook chatbots is kind of like now, you know, exploding in this area um, just because it's the interaction and the mode of the kind of working, you know, going back and forth and having a, you know, a computer kind of help assist. You're not like you're not using a lot of, um, you know, human resources and you're able to interact in a way with images and, and video. And if, if you do have internet access, it's such a great way to interact with these populations. And a lot of uh, technology services are kind of leveraging the chatbots. Um, for, for development purposes. So in some cases, uh, you know, you go to a, you know, you go to a community and you realize, you know, you, you know, it's, it's like a call you have to make as a designer. Do I want to try, you know, in the, in the agricultural use case, you know, you're like, okay, I want to address all of my users because this is, you know, this is what they're trying to do. They want to be able to give them information and if they need help. But in some cases, you know, you, you assess who your users are and you're like, okay, we have... 10% of the users in this group or like this community who are really tech savvy and can I leverage these users and maybe not worry about the other, maybe, you know, get them to kind of bring the other ones on or figure out what's going on from a social in-person interaction that I could leverage. So an example in a nutritional nutrition project in Egypt, again, uh, we had a woman in the community. So the, the, the goal of the project was to get uh, women uh, to provide or to provide support to women on uh, nutritional information like how do you feed your children what are best what are you know what crops should you use from your you know your, what you're growing and, and that sort of thing so there was an already existing behavior that was happening where NGOs uh, that were existing there would set up like these group uh, you know meetings they'd educate what they call these community leaders and then they would rely on them to kind of hold like you know in person you know hangouts at their houses and talk about these things so here is where we decided to kind of focus on those women as our main influencers and to get them to um, you know use our service uh, and then rely on sending them messages that would encourage others to kind of use it or just to get the message so relying on those people is a way to kind of get your biggest bang um, through your buck in terms of uh, access so does anybody, can anybody guess why this may be a controversial map, or no? In Morocco, specifically? Yeah. Yeah. Right, so, well, yeah, I mean, <laughs> they consider it part of Morocco. So uh, Google Maps can be offensive <laughs> sometimes. Uh, so here's an example, and, you know, when you're working, again, in, you know, in countries, different countries, you definitely, you know, if you're working as a designer and a technologist, you can't just rely on others to take care of this stuff because you're doing stuff that's, you know, implying political things, right? So here, um, you know, we actually, we, we uh, created a tool for the government, the government in Morocco, and this is my colleague, actually, and they were doing some usability studies and kind of training, and uh, they showed this map was one of the maps that was used. And the government officials got real, they were, they were livid. They were really upset because, you know, the border is not, is, you know, they, they consider the, the Morocco, the Western Sahara part of Morocco, basically, whereas Google Maps says it. So, you know, there's other maps out there. There's another tool that you could use. Uh, but in general, you know, being uh, sensitive to, to these things, you know, uh, you know, the Palestine-Israel thing is a big one, you know, I'm from that region, and uh, you have to be very careful about how you uh, display those maps. Um, but, but yeah, I mean, there's um, um, considering political stuff, and not just with maps, but in a lot of in a lot of different ways. Especially coming in as you know, the U.S. You're coming from you're you're funded by the U.S. government. You know, considering how does that play out? You know, thinking about that is, is really important. Um, 
cultural and religious norms. I mean, this is a given, right? Uh, but so definitely something, you know, doing, you know, if you can do ethnographic studies, uh, ideally, you know, I always say nothing replaces, you know, you being from that, you know, understanding and like living in that culture, like being a part of that culture and knowing it. But if you're not um, and you're coming in as, you know, as a foreigner, uh, doing as much ethnography, really understanding it because you really, you know, you're going to turn off so many people if you design something and they're just not going to either, they're not going to use it or, um, you know, you're going to, it's going to isolate some people and, 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 and get them upset with you. So in this case, um, you know, we had an idea for, uh, you know, kind of um, connecting supervisors with teachers via SMS groups or WhatsApp groups where they could connect directly with them and, you know, we would facilitate it or like technical people would facilitate that interaction. So, you know, we were showing this idea to, or, you know, kind of doing user studies with the woman in the group and one of them was like, you know, my husband would be really upset because, you know, I cannot get a message from, you know, a supervisor. And we were like, so then we realized, oh, wow, so all the supervisors were men and all the teachers were women. So we had to figure out a way to kind of go around that issue and maybe message it, you know, it could still come from the supervisor, but maybe you message it from the project, right, or from like a group. Um, so these are just things that, you know, you're going to have to put extra uh, care and, um, you know, effort into. So this address privacy and security, uh, you know, we just listened to a great talk on data. Um, just before this one in this room and you know a lot of what they talked about kind of applies here However, like in our case because we are um, you know I thought there was an interesting point that was brought up in that talk Which was you know what if there are no rules in the countries that you're working with in terms of like how you address security and privacy This is when you really as a designer and a user that's like, you know being being uh, careful for your users um, and you know wanting the best experience for them is you know is making sure that you're doing the right thing so we worked in Syria, and you all know about Syria and the conflict there and how you know, crazy and, and uh, dangerous it is in Syria. Um, and the project we did was um, kind of helping enumerators gather data on you know, the, what's happening on the ground. And um, you know, we had to, be, we had to you know, design a special experience to make sure that our enumerators did not, did not um, you know, get, uh, so, you know, get access by you know, ISIS or some, you know, group that is, was, was going to get access to their phone and be like, what are you doing? You know, you're sending data to, you know, get them in trouble. So we, we built in extra features in there to kind of hide in a way what we were doing. So we had the settings icon as the app icon. Um, and so, you know, they wouldn't suspect that it was a different app. And then uh, we had this extra pin feature. So every time you try to access the survey, you had to enter a pin. And this pin was only obtained through like, you know, you had to call via Skype and get your pin and it expired within 30 days. So, you know, extra precautions into whoever got into the app. Um, and then we also made it so regionally people would get different um, surveys based on what region you're in. Um, and then, you know, the last thing I'll say on this topic is, you know, you know, again, related to what you guys were talking about earlier is less is more. You really... You know, you know, you don't want to you don't want to collect data that you do not need. You're collecting data about vulnerable people. Um, you know, try to kind of push against that with your project clients and saying, you know, hey, do we really need this data? Why do we need it? And if you're and if you're collecting it, how do you protect the data? Um, so you know, push against you know collecting the data on these people, even if like you know in the space that you're working in, there are no rules, right? So so you can collect whatever you want to collect. Um, the cost model. So yeah, this is another point where, you know, we're working in the private sector, um, especially at a startup with like unlimited funds, something you, you didn't really have to worry about as much. But when you're working with our, our population, um, you, you know, coming up with innovative and solutions around the cost model uh, is part of our job. You know, we can't just put that on the, PM, the project managers or the um, um, business people to do the work here because you know you're selecting the service as a designer um, and you need to um, know you know who, where is the where who's paying for this so whether it's the if it's the beneficiary how do you limit how do you get him the most information possible with the least amount of money so this was actually an example in Rwanda where they were trying to get information out to I think it was agriculture as well and um, you know they noticed I mean and, and the the end user had to pay for this. And one of the problems with the way that it was done was the information to get to actually what you wanted, you had to send like seven text messages. 
And that's like a lot of money. So even though maybe like from an information architecture perspective, it made sense, it was simpler. From a cost perspective, that wasn't going to work. You know, you want it to be like, you know, one or two and then you're getting to your information. So how do you organize your information so you're getting to what you want, um, you know, really quickly? And then also if the beneficiary is not paying for the, for the service, how do you get the, you know, the, they call them the service providers to, uh, you know, to pay for to pay for the service and what incentives you, can you do from a design perspective to do that? So that's another thing to think about. This chart is from the GSMA report, which is the Global Mobile Network Development Service. They provide reports on how you know, uh, global service mobile providers um, are doing work and really interesting stuff, actually. So I just talked to you about all the kind of the principles of uh, you know, designing for um, for, for developing nations, and uh, I kind of wanted to do a separate thing on the process because you know process is a big you know big thing here. We all understand process as people that work in technology and, and UX and, and design. Um, however, you know I've, I've found that some of the practices that are most useful here, or like when you're working in Western you know countries or industrial industrialized countries, you know are, don't come up as as important. So you know one of the big ones is you know. You know, if you're again, like you know, I like to advocate for working to or to hiring designers that are local to the context. And if you're not, you know, the next best, th best thing is co-designing with your user. So you know, you want your users to come up with ideas. And if you can facilitate, you know, I, I think of it as designers in this case should be facilitators of the design process rather than the designers. How do you get the? How do you get them to design their own experiences um, rather than uh, designing for them, which is super critical in this case. Um, partnering with local designers. So, um, you know, in certain countries like Rwanda and in Egypt, actually, in Uganda, they have a they have a pretty good uh, technology capacity. They may not have as much, you know, design firms and design work, but that's starting to gain momentum. Um, in those cases, you know, you want to advocate with the project to kind of work with some local technologists that you can maybe train or capacity build or exchange. Like, what are you bringing to the table versus them? And, you know, when that happens, you get the best of both worlds. You're getting exchange of ideas, of, of uh, you know, implementation, uh, you know, uh, techniques that you don't know and they don't know. And then you're, you, or, you know, you're exchanging that information, which is like the best. Um, and then the other thing is, so you know, I explained that we work with field staff, right? That's those are the people that that have the expertise in the fields that we are um, working in, whether it's education, agriculture, uh, democracy, and governance. Um, and so, you know, typically uh, they put us in the project um, as as technology firm or designer, maybe for a couple of months in the beginning, and they're like, okay, you figure out your thing, do it, and give us the technology. That's kind of how they expect things to work. Um, and, and, you know, unfortunately, you're not going to get the best, you know, obviously, you're not going to get the best result that way. So th there's two things you could do here, and actually, you should do both. One is um, push to work for um, a longer duration. And, you know, this is, you know, gets down to how the budgeting works. And it's kind of, you know, like, you have to explain to them the agile development process, the user assent, and that, that's in its own a whole thing. Uh, so, you know, I'm still working on that within my, the, the groups that I work with, and I'm not there yet. Uh, but, you know, getting there, hopefully. And then the other one is uh, kind of building the capacity of the people that you work with to, you know, kind of get them to understand the design process um, and ha help help you execute it, whether it's remotely or they, they're doing more of the work and you're just kind of like on a consulting basis, you know, to figure out models that will work where you're not just like dropping, you know, what you learned in the first month and assuming that's what the case is. You, we know that's never the case, right? Iterative design and agile is, is critical to get to the right solution. Um, and then, yeah, getting uh, access to users. So this, as I mentioned earlier, is definitely a challenge that um, you know I've seen um, I've seen in, in in my work. So when we were working on we were working on a refugee app uh, for for Syrian children to keep up their Arabic, and uh, in this case, it was a very low budget project, and it was also a project where um, you wanted access to some children in Syria. So in that case, it was like really hard for me to you know kind of figure out how, and it's also children, which is like makes it on top of that another you know hard thing. How are you going to get children to um, you know participate in your studies or research? Uh, so you have to be innovative about that. So you know we kind of I, I figured out some you know way to like do a remote Skype call with you know kind of walk through by the facilitator in the country, kind of going through the screens and me being there as a backup. You know I speak Arabic, so that's helpful, so I could listen in. 
Um, so, you know, like figuring out, you've got to be really innovative with doing this. You know, the remote usability study is something that I think we all are getting more innovative with, but in this context and in this uh, type of work, it's even more important to think about ways to like be innovative with getting access to users. Another way is to get proxy users. So if you don't have, you know, maybe you can find some Syrian children that have come to the U.S. Uh, it might not be exactly, and there might be, they might be limited, or people that speak Arabic, or, or other migrant communities that maybe can give you a little bit of a feel of what, it, what it's like to leave a war, to, you know, torn country. Um, so, you know, these are the things that, that kind of help with that. That's us in uh, Rwanda, you were talking to the Prime Minister. So. Um, so, is anybody familiar with the ICT for D community? If you work in development, yeah. So, um, you know, so this talk was tailored to uh, you guys who I assumed were more in the technology space um, and didn't know much about international development or don't have the context of international development and how aid works and how technology deployed there. However, in the, in the context of, uh, you know, international development, there's a group that are technologists and, um, you know, in that space, you know, people understand international development, right? They know cultural sensitivities. They know um, a lot of things um, about, uh, you know, how, how to be careful about political situations. Um, but they don't know digital. They don't know di digital development. They don't know design as well. So, but there's a group, there's a group and it's growing that is focusing on this. And they're called the ICT for D community. Um, and uh, they came up with uh, these nine principles for digital development. Um, there are a few of us that were designers in the group, so we pushed for the design with the user, you know, as that had to be a thing that was on there, so, which is good, which is actually interesting because, you know, I would say that the development world, um, they were ahead of us in that game. Like, they were always field-based and working with the user. I think their issue more is kind of, you know, understanding how technology works in that context, and the other issue is this iterative, you know, type of prototyping, which is what's lacking more in that context versus, you know, the designing with the user. Um, I think they, they have that, you know, in mind. It's already ingrained in the development type of world. Um, so it's just kind of interesting. Um, but, uh, yeah, the other ones, you know, they have privacy and security, which is kind of a critical, and I talked about that already. Um, one that's, you know, interesting here I want to talk about is the build for sustainability and the, the design for scale. So, you know, one of the things in development is, you know, the lifetime of the project is usually maybe two, three, five years max. And so a lot of what's, what's dangerous with these projects is, you know, you don't want to go in there and come up with a solution for just that period. You have to think about how this is going to be something that is like going to be self-sustained within the country. How are they going to continue? Where are the funds coming? So if you build a technology product for them and you hand it over to that country and, you know, and there's no tech capacity to sustain it, it's not going to work. So, you know, this is something you really have to think about. Um, and then on top of that, there's a lot of, you know, what they call polite, like pilot tysis, I think is what they say. So in the development world, there's so many pilots. So like, you know, they started this pilot and then funding ran out. So and there's a, in, 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 uh, in Uganda, actually, there's like, I think they have, I don't know, thousands of health products and none of them are being used. So this is a problem we're facing with technology. And like, you know, you, you would think, you know, if, yeah, if you continued on and you iterate it and you try to get, get it further, you, it would go somewhere. But that's not happening currently. So this is a problem that we're, you know, <clears throat> having. So designing for scale is something that they, you know, wanted to highlight as a principle that we as technologists and designers in this field need to, need to be aware of. Um, yeah, and you know, the other ones are kind of uh, self-explanatory, but there's a website online, it's very well done, and it's called um, Digital Design Principles. Um, I recommend you looking into that if you're interested. Um, so how does this apply to my work as a designer, not working in international development? Obviously, if you're interested in working, you know, that's great, because now you know about it a little bit more, but if you're not, how does this apply to me? So one of my uh, professors at Carnegie Mellon, he was a big advocate of extreme users. How many of you guys are familiar with extreme users and you know trying to do research with them? So you know the idea is um, you know if you try to understand how an extreme user um, is going to use your product, you're actually going to do a better experience for everybody else um, because it gives you ideas. Like you're like oh you know you might not do that exact same use case because then you might be isolating the rest of the you know the users. But you're actually, you know, you're, if you do it really in a, in a creative way, you come up with really interesting ideas. So in, in our case, I do feel like working in development um, has exposed me to some extreme users. 
Um, and thinking about that made me think about how can I apply some of what I've thought about for development to you know, our general population, or Western industrialized countries. Um, yeah, so obviously, an obvious one is learning disabilities. So if you want to be impactful with your work, um, you know, you're not trying to get, you know, you're trying to like think about some of the users that may not be exactly super literate or have learning disabilities, dyslexia. You know, the text, you know, you, being less reliant on text is, is something to think about, right? How can you, you know, be more image focused, audio focused, um, or whatnot um, to, you know, make sure they're included in, in your designs? Um, <clears throat> So yeah, this one um, you know I'm passionate about is diversity, inclusion, and equitable design. Um, you know, you know I think about this from a perspective of you know we have a lot of minorities in this country, whether they're Muslims, African Americans, Latin, LGBTQ. How do you uh, make sure you're not isolating them in your designs? You know, I mean I think thinking of the social, cultural norms, the political ones. Um, you know, what are we putting into our products that may make them less likely to uh, use them? You know, and and. And you know, we all know what the diversity numbers are at Silicon Valley, you know, who's working in tech. You know, it's not a very diverse crowd, right? So ideally, we have designers from those backgrounds kind of pitching in and saying, um, you know, we, uh, you know I'm, I'm, I know as a Muslim, this would be offensive, you know, or African American, this is not, but we don't have, it's not, you know, the numbers are pretty sad, actually. So, you know, as a designer and, and working and, you know, for, you know, a big, you know, user base, you know, thinking about how to make it more inclusive in following some of these principles that we're applying, you know, worldwide or globally. Working in an unfamiliar environment. So this one is, um, yeah, I mean, generally, if, you know, we all, we're never only designing for ourselves. Some cases we are, but some cases we're not. And so some of the principles around, uh, you know, doing co-design with the user, those apply. The processy things, uh, you know, kind of give you some ideas of how to approach uh, designing for people that are, you know, kind of unfamiliar to you. Um, and so, Involving local leaders, you know, like that's kind of a thing to do. Uh, capacity building of people in, in community. Uh, and, and so you get them familiar with your work and you get familiar more with them. So kind of partnering up with them. Yeah, and at this point, and I talked about, touched about year, earlier, is collaborating across sectors. This has been like, you know, very, um, I've learned so much in the past three years working in development from, you know, in all these different sectors. And, um, you know, I, I think it's great. I sometimes feel, you know, like the weaker one, like, you know, like I'm here and I have to like prove who I am as a technologist and a designer. Uh, but, it, you know, and on the other hand, I do think like the best ideas and the best um, design and technology is going to happen when we bring this collaboration across sectors. You bring like the best of the best in, in education and, you know, whatever, in, in agriculture, working with the designers and the technologists, and, and not on our terms as technologists and designers, but also having them lead the way and bringing you in. So, you know, I think a lot could happen here um, that could lead to interesting results. And then how many, how many of you guys know the concept of the weird? It's in social science concept. So Western, educated, industrialized, rich, um, developed uh, users. So like the idea is, you know, a lot of the research that happened in psychology and in, um, you know, social sciences is based on those set of users, right? So some of them might not apply to the rest of the world. Um, and, you know, it's like a wake-up call to the social sciences field. But it's also, I think it's something for us to think of as designers and technologists, what we're designing, what we learn, if, you know, especially if you're educated Western, Western country and industrial, industrialized country, what you know as a designer and your know-how may not apply to the rest of the world. And it's kind of, kind of like a wake-up call, right? Um, so, yeah, these are some of the things I thought of. I'd love to, you know, I think, you know, once, uh, you know, you guys are thinking about this, uh, you know, I'd love to hear your thoughts on how you think some of what I talked about kind of applies or could be, you know, cross-cutting and um, apply to what you do in your work. That's all I have today. Um, wanted to thank, uh, you know, my, some of the people that I actually got some content from that work in the field. These guys are great. If you find them on, in, on Twitter, you know, follow them. Um, not all of them are on Twitter, but they're somewhere out there. Um, and then my, my organization, Souptel, who I work with, and they, I collaborated with them as well. Um, so, you know, we're, we're available to chat and answer any questions as well. I also have some resources that I'd love to share with you guys. Um, these are great if you're interested on the topic. Um, you know, I'll leave this up as I, I you know, leave, um, get you guys to ask questions. Um, but, you know, some of them are around... Um, you know, how, how do you get into the social innovation world, 
there's a book on that, and then there's um, um, the, the Digital Design Principles uh, site, and there's actually a Twitter account that is now kind of posting uh, jobs that are in this kind of sector and in the in the the government sector, um, you know, that are more socially impactful type jobs, which I kind of recommend you follow. And that's our organization. Yes. Are you going to post your slides anywhere? Um. I think they're being posted. I don't know. I think the organizers would know, but I'm happy to share. Previous person mentioned just on her lecture, but yeah, I mean, I'm happy to share them. Yeah, was it uh, reuse and something? I yeah. don't remember what the other one was. Uh, oh, reuse and improve. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I've seen there is you know a certain amount of of uh, use of open source stuff, but there's also a tremendous uh, kind of we have to start fresh because our funder is you know wants this. So there's that's something that I, I found you have to kind of fight back against. Um, yes, yeah, hundred uh, percent. 14 times. Wait, what is that? Oh, so not reinvent the wheel 14 yes, times. Yes, yeah. and I mean, that's a problem, like I was saying, the politis, pilot tysis or whatever that word was, yeah. is definitely happening. Um, and, and it's something, you know, I have to push for as a designer that, you know, I think this is not the best for my users, you know, because sometimes the budgetary and is, is kind of coming from a different angle, right? When you're designing collaboratively, um, when do you find it's like important to mix up the environment to make the user more comfortable and more natural with the data that you're getting and making it feel like they're not designing in a bubble, but. Okay, hey, sorry, I can explain that again. Like when you're designing collaboratively. Mm -hmm. um, with the user you mean? Yeah, like with the designing? user. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And they're out of their environment to like give natural design decisions, mm -hmm. when do you make the, the choice to kind of switch up the environment to go mm -hmm. like on site or somewhere where? Yeah, okay. yeah, that's a really good point. And you know, I mean, I think one of the things that I found was, you know, we're used to in this, at least in this country, you know, focus groups and user study, people get that concept, even if you're not in technology or design. There, when you go to these, you know, some of these countries, um, you know, it's a little bit weird that you're like bringing them together and like, hey, we need your help. Let's, uh, they're like, what do you want? You know, it's like, what's going on here? Um, and so I, I like to push for whatever, you know, I can to go on the field and have somebody locally that is, can like be my kind of person. If I'm not, you know, in the Middle East, I'm very comfortable being that person, but in other, like if I go to Africa and areas like Rwanda, Uganda, I, I want somebody locally um, that can kind of be that person, you know, with me or a few others that are kind of helping me facilitate this workshop. And but ideally, you're in their environment. Um, uh, you know, I, I think for many reasons, you know, come to make them feel more comfortable. Also, for you to get an idea, like you get so much by seeing what's happening. You know, in their like you go to their village, you're like, oh wow, they only have one class. Like you know, you see things. Like the physical observation is a huge, you know, input into what you're doing. And uh, um, so you're killing two birds with one stone. You're doing a collaborative session, and you're learning about their environment as well. Yeah. Just curious, you were talking about the uh, employee or whatever help apps that are out there that I guess were developed through grant funding and, mm -hmm. and now are, yeah. are no longer supported. Is there has there been thought given to a way to kind of reuse and recycle those to be able to you know have those in some sort of a place and evaluate? what worked, what didn't, yeah. and kind of cherry pick information out of it, you so know, you're not starting from scratch. Yeah, you know, I think what's happening, what they're encouraging is, if you are working on a health initiative, um, you know, you as in your, there's a technology component, they're in their, now in the, in the RFPs, they're saying, please make sure, like, they're, they're only requiring you to reuse what's already there, which is great, I think. So, um, you know, it's being, it's being put in as part of the, you know, the contract, so I think that's how the USAID is kind of trying to tackle that. Um, but again, you know, I think um, you know it's on it's on the technology vendors and the designers and to push for you know more impact versus you know the getting the funding right. Like I think that's that's part of the problem, right? 
Um, so, you know, and I think having more designers, more user-centered people that are like advocating for usage and kind of helping them like understand why didn't this work? Can you do like a user usability study? Um, because there's not much of that happening, right? It's just like, oh, it didn't work. Why didn't it work? We don't know. Um, but, you know, if you have more of those type of types of user or like, um, yeah, people that understand that field, I think we're going to get there faster, um, hopefully. Mm -hmm. And it says something about how contracts today are not very well equipped for making sure that, uh, you know, at the start of the contract, before you've even validated the problem exists, there is some kind of outcome defined mm -hmm. that they yes. want. Um, what is the status of that today, and do you see progress being made on that front? Uh, that's a great question. <laughs> and, uh, um, you know, unfortunately, I don't work on, like, I'm not working on the U.S., I don't work on the USAID side, I don't work on the contracting side. There's a global development lab, which I believe is doing some of that work. Um, so they're more, they come from more of a technology, you know, background. They're not implementers, they're more, like, coming, helping coming up with the RFPs. Um, and it's a problem that they, they're aware of. Now, USAID is a huge organization, and um, I don't know, I can't give you, like, numbers and saying, like, for sure they're tackling this. I do know that, that some people in the organizations are aware of that. Um, and, you know, like the UN is actually better at that. UN, you know, kind of gives you more contracts that are, you know, this is the problem and, you know, we need to solve it. They don't, be like, they don't define the output as much, uh, whereas the USAID type contracts tend to be a little bit more, you know, they don't understand the agile, you know, human-centered design process as much, at least the people that are writing these contracts that I've seen. Um, but but I, I do feel that there are people that know about it. Um, I can't like I can't tell you exactly um, how well it's going. You know, um, it, we're pushing. You know, we you know we we complain about it a lot as a technology vendor and design vendor. Um, and we even like the thing is not even the funders, even the implementing partners. Some of them don't get. They don't understand. Um, uh, and they just want to work, they're comfortable. They've been working at these agencies for like 30, 40 years. You know, they, they have really extreme domain expertise. And, uh, you know, they're used to how they're working. You know, when you come to government, you guys work in government, you know how it is. It's, you know, things, things it's hard to change things, right? So uh, with that in mind, you know, I'm hopeful, but standing by, <laughs> you know, figuring out ways to work around that, I guess. say the initial phase of approaching um, uh, um, some kind of uh, project for, for development is to win hearts and minds? Is that like the first, absolutely first phase of, of approaching? Oh yeah, I mean for sure, advocacy of what you're building and getting okay. people on my, getting people on board is definitely part of, yeah, is definitely part of the process. Okay. And whether that's through technology or through the project itself. It's okay, so that. once you gain that consensus, does that then shape the design or the approach to your design for the, the, the solutions to the problems of whatever you've identified in that particular region? Yes, definitely. And sometimes, sorry, is that your question? Did you want to add yeah, to that? Yeah, yeah, yes. Uh, okay, so I'm going to inherit a problem um, in, the, in the coming years. Uh, I have to figure out what to do with a, a fishing village of 100 poor fishermen on, a, on an mm -hmm. island in the Philippines. Is this a real example? Or are you yes. Oh, nice. Yes. Okay, so, um, yes, winning hearts and minds, that was the obvious thing to me, but mm -hmm. it's not as... Uh, simple and straightforward as that because um, what I've seen from anecdotes from people who have done similar things in this region, you make, you try to make powerful, you make, try to make friends with powerful and influential people to help you provide resources and to you know, help win hearts and minds. But unfortunately in, in this area, when you make powerful friends, you instantly become the enemy of the, the enemy of that powerful friend. And those powerful friends don't necessarily always watch your back. Mm -hmm. So, ultimately sad anecdotes of uh, very visionary, brilliant individuals from outside who ended up dead because mm -hmm. um, the enemies of your friend now target you as an enemy and if you become too successful, they, they, they target you for, for death. Okay, so, that's my first problem with respect to tackling this problem. It's not even identifying the problems and then mm -hmm. trying to garner yeah. you know, resources yeah. from all over the world to try to no, yeah. I, I, have to, I, have to, I have to figure out how I'm, I'm going to live. Yeah. I mean, are you, are you working problem. on your own as a technology vendor, or are there, is there a project? Oh, there's a, there's a project on this island uh, with respect to um, yeah. doing things like cleaning up the ecology 
and um, uh, providing you know basic resources like drinkable water to this to this village. Okay, so uh, um, you know there's all sorts of technologies, wonderful technologies out there that you can implement. You know, and there's all sorts of great organizations that will provide you resources and all that. But I, I need to be able to okay, win hearts and minds, great. Mm -hmm. Uh, when maybe the, the influence of a very powerful individual of the area, and then somehow watch my back. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, okay. I, I, yeah, and I think, I mean, ideally you're not on your own on this, and there's others, you know, there's, you know you're thinking about this from a holistic, not only technology piece. Correct, correct. Um, because this is, yeah, it's a social issue that you have to address. Take so, technology out of the picture, right? So I've done, my, I've done my initial surveys yeah. of the ecology, mm -hmm of uh, needs, social needs and physical yeah. needs of, of, the, of the people I'm trying to help, but I need to figure out how I'm going to protect myself as well, so. Um, yeah, well, I mean, so. yeah, no, that's, that's, a, that's a difficult situation, problem. yeah. I yeah. mean, you know, working in, you know, some of the aid workers that work in Afghanistan and in, you know, Syria. Uh, I worked in, in Honduras a bit, and, you know, there's some of the gang, we would go into like the high uh, gang violence areas, and, you know, they definitely, you know, the companies that I worked for at that point, they have teams that that's their main job to come up with strategies for protecting you know, the staff. So whether you need to consult with a group that can help you with that or whether it's partnering with you know, people locally, it's just, it's definitely, it's a field, you know, it's not like um, it's something you just want to take lightly, you know, you got to approach it correctly and, you know, understand why the motivations, what's going on. Um, but yeah, hopefully it's helpful. <laughs> Hi, uh, have you had any issues with, um, in very patriarchal countries where, for example, you mentioned women's illiteracy, mm -hmm. that there was resistance from, say, educating women, mm -hmm. which would be a, you know, break with their power source, essentially? Yeah, definitely. I mean, we, um, whenever there's a, um, you know, that kind of work we have to do, they usually hire gender studies specialists. Um, and, uh, you know, they are the ones guiding us on this. So, which is great, you know, as, as I said, you know, you know, we come in as technology designers, we're not specialties in all these fields, but you're gaining so much from these, you know, they're approaching it from like, hey, we want to do this, but we don't want to offend a culture, you know, or like, um, we want to do things that fall, you know, in, in whatever um, makes sense to them, but also, you know, it, you, know you don't want to force them to do things, that, you know, usually these governments in these countries are asking for these things and in partnership with the USAID are implementing it. Um, but yeah, I mean, you definitely are, you know, need to read up on what your gender study specialist is recommending in these cases. Um, you know, you don't want to be like, oh, no, I got to impose my ways. Like, you know, that's the thing. That's just not the way it works. I mean, you're doing, you're doing development ways. Like what I think of as, yeah, I, you know, it's not fair that I can't text another, you know, person because he's a guy. That's just, you know, you, you know I, I'm not going to change that, you know, like this is this is on them to change as a, you know, they want education, let's get them education in the way that they need to get education. Um, and, and, you know, make make sure we're not um, isolating or marginalizing anybody, um, but understanding the gender implications there. Yeah. Any other questions? Well, thank you. Um, appreciate.